The next speaker is Anton Zetzer, and the talk is about implementing Martin Loeb's meaning explanations for intuitionistic type theory in Agda. Okay, thanks a lot for the introduction. This is joint work with Peter Dupier. Um, so this is somehow goes back, is quite different from most talks we had because we are going here back to the more uh, proof theoretic and philosophical foundations of uh, uh, origins of type theory. Um, and uh, what we are doing here in this work is we are looking at Martin Löw's meaning explanations. So the meaning explanations came back into the very early work of Martin Löw where he introduced type theory and tried uh, and gave these explanations and the goal was in some sense to give uh, a consistency argument uh, for type theory. So essentially he took every judgment of type theory you take and you uh, um, I would say you, you for every for every judgment in type theory, you, you give a big natural language sentence, and then you show the, then you look at each of these rules and show if the meaning of of each hypothesis uh, of a rule holds, then the meaning of the conclusion holds. So and but uh, but this argument was necessarily uh, it, because you cannot get around. A girdle, so you cannot prove the consistency of any theory. So, uh, but what you can give is you can give some kind of a philosophical insight into its consistency. So Martin Löw formalized everything in a, a natural language, uh, and what we are what we are doing in this work is now to actually formalize it, which of course goes against the whole spirit because. <laughs> It's, it should be a philosophical argument, etc. But it's still very interesting because then you find out lots of fine details. So actually one little sentence of Martin Löw becomes uh, three pages of ACTA code uh, and there are lots of things to decide upon. Uh, so our goal is to formalize these meaning explanations in ACTA. There is a actually a second goal and that comes came actually before <coughs> I s before we started with this project is as well to look at a type theory where we have access to the collection of partial terms that goes back to some work I did on the extended predicative Marlowe universe where you wanted to build a universe closed under a partial function where you don't know that the partial function is total, so uh, and for this you need access to the set of partial elements. So my original work was then to formalize this type theory in ACTA by, in some sense, giving an internal model of uh, of ACTA. Uh, uh, I used originally Pfefferman systems, but now we uh, uh, Peter Dubier convinced me that we should look at the same thing in a, in a style of uh, Martin Löw's meaning explanations. A little disclaimer, so uh, we found out when discussing it with PDP, <laughs> we agree on almost everything philosophically and probably ev everybody else who is involved in these discussions will completely disagree with everything every everybody else is saying. At the same time, we completely agree on all the technical details. So, so it's like <laughs> uh, you see here that uh, mathematics as a unifying language. So how do we do it? So first we start to define the set of uh, raw terms. So um, uh, and uh, we take ter term n is a set of terms with and free variables, so we use the Brown indices, so uh, for every finite natural number we have the, uh, the i's, for every i in fin n we have the i's variable is a term, we have this hash denotes uh, the application of one term to the other, 
Uh, we have lambda abstraction, which takes a term with n plus 1 variables and gives a term of n variables. Then we have zero successor, and then we have as well terms for types or for sets, like for the natural numbers, arrow, pi type at the moment. So this all is work in progress, so the whole thing is still evolving. Uh, and then we have what Pierre Martin Leff calls canonical terms. So these are essentially terms, uh, closed terms in weak hat normal form. So you have a, a lambda applied to any term with one free variable is a canonical term. You have series a canonical term, and successor is a canonical term if, if applied to a non-canonical term. So uh, that's what Per, per Martin Leuf explains quite in detail uh, that, for instance, success of 2 plus 3 is a canonical natural number. Um, uh, and then we have uh, natural numbers, etc. Uh, and then we have contexts. And this one I want to skip. And now we have uh, reductions. Uh, and this follows how uh, Martin Leuf was explaining how these programs are computed. So uh, if you look at uh, um, beta reduction, so when does the, uh, um, or when does a term applied to another term reduce to V? Yeah, this happens if C evaluates to a canonical term, and a canonical term is lambda uh, C uh, applied to some B. And if the B with a uh, sub, uh, with the variable substituted by a uh, reduces to v, and c applied to a uh, reduces to v. So that's just uh, big step semantics, um, and lazy evaluation takes place. Uh, and then we have as well, for instance, a recursion. Uh, so uh, the rec is somehow primitive. It's a higher order primitive recursion operator. And if C reduces to zero, and, and the zero case reduces to V, then rec DEC reduces to V, etc. So um, the successor case, etc. And now we can define uh, the meaning of, of judgments. Uh, first, we look at what are the, so um, per, uh, uh, Martin Leff always talks about uh, the canonical and non-canonical elements. So the non-canonical elements are programs which reduce to a canonical elements. So we have formalized it is as a record type. Uh, uh, what is a non-canonical element? Uh, it's given by a canonical element, a proof that A reduces to this canonical element, and a proof that A, this canonical element is not is a canonical element of the original set. Uh, and now we can define now the canonical elements of natural numbers and uh, pi types and other types. Let's look at the natural number. And it's quite interesting here. Normally, when you define natural numbers in type zero, you say zero is a natural number. And if n is a natural number, then successor n is a natural number. Here we now have we have a proof that zero is a natural number. And if we have a uh, if we have a, an, a term and a proof that b is a natural number, then the successor of it we have a proof that successor of it is a natural number. And then we have something for pi and uh, yeah. That's an interesting slide which I need to skip uh, because it becomes that's where induction recursion comes into play. Uh, and then uh, we look at all the judgments, and it always goes like this you give now a proof, so you have somehow a term, a raw context, and now you give proof that this raw context is actually a context. You have a raw context and a raw environment, and give a proof that this raw environment is a is in this context. And you have a 
con uh, row context and a is row set, uh, type and give a proof that this a is a type and uh, a is a small a is an element of this type. Uh, and then you give proofs that everything is uh, is in this element. So, for instance, you prove that uh, zero is a natural number. Uh, uh, so the zero program is actually an element of the natural numbers, etc. Uh, where the hardest work is actually then to show that it's clo uh, primitive recursion. Is actual, so that somehow justifies the elimination of the natural numbers, namely to show that it's closed under primitive recursion. So, yeah, to conclude, so we have formalized meaning explanations in ACTA. Uh, it was subs it's much more work than you think at first place, uh, and uh, part of this work is to uh, work on a type theory where we have direct access to the set of partial elements. Thank you very much. I think we have time for one or two questions. So, in the definition of the um, uh, inductive recursive definition, I mean the slides you could show. Um, did you did you have to prove some kind of proof irrelevance, like that? I mean that the semantics of a type is determined already by its um, expression and not by its derivation that it's in this Thai uh, family, right? Did you have like some kind of proof? Did you have yeah, to show yeah, that, that uh, it yeah, doesn't yeah. depend on on how it enters the Thai uh, family here? Uh, so the project here with the meaning explanation hasn't reached this point, but before I was working in a version using Pfefferman system, and actually, yes, at some point you need to show that these... Uh, uh, that these are actually um, that there is only one term for uh, so uh, yeah um, that yeah that that not C is not mapped to two different two dif two different sets need uh, was was actually needed to be proved, which was uh, when I did it with Pfefferman system it wasn't so difficult it was a <coughs> triviality, but the interesting thing is here. If you look at it, uh, oh, you don't see it here, but here you see, for instance, the successor. It depends, the successor proof only depends on the proof that the term itself, where you apply it to, is a hidden argument. Mm -hmm. So, uh, which explains a bit why uh, Martin Leuf, who originally was actually working with terms and mm -hmm. proof, suddenly said, oh, everything needs to be just proofs, uh, so you don't, uh, he didn't refer in his work anymore to the partial underlying terms. Right. Uh. So I, I was asking because the EL function you show, it a pattern matches both on the, the expression and the derivation of tie A, right? And we had to show in our formalization that um, uh, it doesn't depend on the second argument, really. So if you exchange it for a different one, you still get the same predicate out. So that's just... Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So yeah. this actually, yes. So you need to prove that element uh, I of think let's continue this conversation after. So the element session. of AP, if you have two proofs that A, a is an element uh, of a natural number, then, uh, then the extension is... So two elements are the same, yes. Yeah. So extensions are the same. Let's thank the speaker.